Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 21 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises on the wall of a tenement building that is flanked by dark alleys and fire escapes. The figure of a merchant sailor enters from the wings and strolls to the fire escape. He stops and lights a cigarette before introducing himself as both the narrator and also a character in the play we are about to see. He tells us that he will turn back time to 1938 in St. Louis, Missouri, a time of a still dissolving economy following the Great Depression that prefaced this decade. As he leads us into the start of the play, the dark wall of the tenement slowly dissolves into transparency, revealing the living room of the apartment where he lives with his mother, Amanda, and his sister, Laura. This is the start of the story of Tom Wingfield and his family, a dreamlike portrayal of the past of its author of a similar name, Thomas or Tennessee Williams. The play is The Glass Menagerie. Tennessee Williams' breakthrough success, which opened to rave reviews and mesmerized audiences on Broadway in March 1945. The play had had a short run in Chicago first, where it had generated buzz among the cognoscenti, but failed to sell well, and Williams was not confident about the play. He said at the time that he loved the story and the characters, but doubted the audience appeal and strength of the plot. He was also bruised by the failure a few years earlier of his first professional play, Battle of Angels, which had received terrible reviews on its trial run in Boston and closed before its planned transfer. He needn't have feared, for on opening night, the cast of The Glass Menagerie received 24 curtain calls, and its shy 34-year-old author was called up onto the stage to receive the applause. His life was transformed into one of fame and fortune. His success would be confirmed two years later when he returned to Broadway with his most famous work, A Streetcar Named Desire. Williams wrote over 30 plays in his lifetime, his most enduring of which all date from the first half of his long career, and in addition to The Glass Menagerie and Streetcar include Summer and Smoke, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Sweet Bird of Youth, and Night of the Iguana, to name a few. The Glass Menagerie is now a standard on educational curricula and has been revived many times since its Broadway success. The wonderful lead roles have attracted top performers over the years, including Jessica Tandy, Jessica Lange, Sally Field, Sarah Paulson, Brenda Blythen, Claire Skinner, and Cherry Jones, who played Amanda in the 2013 Broadway production directed by John Tiffany, a production which earned seven Tony Award nominations and was revived in London in 2017, with Cherry repeating her role and Kate O'Flynn giving an ethereal performance as Laura. The Guardian described John Tiffany's beautiful staging as a loan worth the price of a ticket. The production was nominated for seven Olivier Awards, which in a normal year I suggest it would have won, if not for the fact that Harry Potter and the Cursed Child swept the board that year. For John Tiffany, it was a sweet consolation because he also directed Harry Potter and won the award as best director for that show. Which makes me hugely excited and honored to be able to say that John is joining me here today to talk about Tennessee Williams' magical play, The Glass Menagerie. Welcome, John. Thanks so much for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Any, any chance to talk about this play, to be honest with you. <laughs> Perfect. Before we jump into the play, I just want to fill out the introduction to you, John. John Tiffany is the winner of two Tony Awards, an Olivier, a Drama Desk, and an Obie Award as a director. His most prominent productions include Black Watch from 2006, when he was a founding associate director of the National Theatre of Scotland, the stage musical Once, based on the film of the same name, which he directed in New York and earned him Tony, Drama Desk, and Obie Awards. As associate director of the Royal Court Theatre, his productions include The End of History, Enda Walsh's adaptation of Roald Dahl's The Twits, Hope, The Pass, and Road, a 30th anniversary revival of Jim Cartwright's classic commentary on Thatcher's Britain which I loved. This list does not cover all of his work, of course, but I cannot but mention again his most illustrious credit, directing both the West End and Broadway productions of the momentous Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, winning not only the Olivier, but the Tony, Drama Desk, and Outer Critics Circle Awards 
for his electrifying staging. So, the glass menagerie, John, seems like an altogether quieter affair than Harry Potter. <laughs> so I wanted to start by asking you, what was it about the play that attracted you to want to direct it? And why do you think it's a play that still speaks to, say, contemporary audiences? Well, I, I thought I was going to be a doctor. That was the plan in my life. <laughs> um, you know, so I'd done all sciences A-levels and went to Glasgow University with the intention of following that plan. But then... Uh, it was 1990, which was Glasgow, was the European city of culture. So suddenly I got exposed to the work of people like Pina Bausch and Robert Lepage and, and the Rooster Group. And within days, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of dropped the whole idea of becoming a doctor and, <laughs> and I'd switched to doing theatre and classics. And so I wasn't very well read, you know, Shakespeare, etc. And I'd done lots of performing, but, uh, you know, only on an amateur stage. And uh, But I had a brilliant, brilliant professor Professor Alistair Cameron, who's no longer with us, but he kind of took me under his under his wing, knowing that I wasn't as maybe up to up to speed as some of my uh, fellow classmates. And one of the first plays he gave me was The Glass Menagerie, and he just went, "Your life's about to be changed," and he couldn't have been you know, more correct. He was right, yeah. Well, it was the introduction to begin with, which we'll talk about later, I'm sure, to do with his what he calls plastic theatre, but also as you just described then beautifully the the kind of merchant sailor who arrives at this fire escape, uh, you know, smoking a cigarette as he continues to do throughout the whole play and kind of brutally and moodily tells us that he's going to take us back in time. I was just hooked because there's something about that introduction, the honesty of it and the generosity of it and clarity of it that I found exhilarating. The idea that he told us exactly where we were, that he was taking us back in time, who the characters in the play were, and what the kind of mood and the, the, the atmosphere of the play is. And I just, I, I found that and still find that incredibly groundbreaking that somebody comes on stage and says, yeah. this is who I am. You're a theatre audience. We're in a theatre and I'm, I'm going to tell you about a memory. And, and, a, and, and, and I suppose, you know, it just spoke of the liveness of theatre as opposed to the realism of what some theatre makers try and recreate and, and present to an audience. What I've always loved about theatre is the fact that it acknowledges that it's live and it acknowledges that it's an illusion. Yeah. And the glass menagerie for me is the top of that particular mountain of, of success when it comes to that kind of world. Yes. Well, we'll talk about the form because it was definitely innovative at its time and still feels like that, as you just described. I thought when you were going to start talking about your career choice as a doctor that it had something to do with your mother as this play does about the influence of the mother and their, her expectation on her son's career. But I was also going to ask you, the play is set back in, as I mentioned, 1938, late 30s anyway, and there are references that set it there. How do you think that still resonates with us today then? It's Because it's not really a period piece in that sense, is it? It's not, no. Although the references to, you know, an impending world war and, you know, Guernica and their lives, really, uh, you know, coming out of, well, still in, but towards the end of the Great Depression mm -hmm. in America tells you so much about the situation that Amanda is certainly aware of and that Tom is trying to escape from and that Laura is just oblivious to. Yes. And, and also Jim, when Jim appears and brings in a, an absolute cold ice water shock of, of, of reality, really, yeah. and, where, and where America is heading. But Williams himself said, to be truly universal, you have to be ultra-specific. Um, it's not an accurate quote of that, but it's, it's the way it sits in me. And I've always felt that, that it has to be truly believable, this, despite his expressionism. It has to be truly believable in terms of performance, in terms of truth of what's going on, in order for it to actually resonate out and speak to 18 year old boy from Yorkshire who's just recently arrived at Glasgow University and decided very arrogantly despite his mum who was a district nurse <laughs> so <laughs> very very astute of you there who has decided that he doesn't want to be a doctor anymore he actually wants to be working theatre which of course horrified his parents um... <laughs> I'm sure they're proud now John I'm sure they are I'm struck as you say I mean the universality of it is, is certainly in the fact that these are genuine family relationships and there's emotional truth in it, and we'll come to talk about how he achieves this emotional truth in this innovative form. And in fact, actually about the time as well, it might also be useful thought to, to say a little bit about Tennessee Williams because 
This is perhaps his most autobiographical play, so I think it might be helpful to sketch in a few of the biographical details of his life until the point where he wrote this play. So forgive me for a few minutes if I do this sort of by rote. Forgiven. Thank you. He was born Thomas Lanier Williams in 1911 in Columbus, Mississippi, the second child and first son of Edwina and Cornelius Williams. He had a sister, Rose, two years older, and a brother, Dakin, eight years younger. His father, Cornelius, was a traveling salesman before the family moved to St. Louis, and then he became a manager at the International Shoe Company. In 1929, Tom started the University of Missouri, but this is the year of the Great Depression, and because of his family's financial difficulties, he's forced to withdraw, and his father gets him a job at the shoe company, which he described as a living death. He's finally able to return to university in St. Louis in 1936 before transferring to University of Iowa to study playwriting and production. In 1937, while he is away at university in Iowa, his sister, Rose, suffers a serious breakdown and is admitted to a psychiatric hospital. She would spend the next 20 years in this institution and in 1943 became one of the first people in the United States to undergo a frontal lobotomy, a procedure authorized by her mother and without Tom's foreknowledge. Although Rose was finally released from hospital in 1956, she never recovered the ability to live an independent life, and Williams was haunted by this tragedy for the rest of his life. In 1939, Williams published a short story using for the first time the Christian name of Tennessee, which was a nod to his genealogy, which had included the first governor of Tennessee. It's a dramatic flourish that affirms his Southern identity as well as perhaps his view of himself as some form of pioneer. By this time, he had left the family home and was living in New Orleans and beginning to make an independent life of his own, including having his first homosexual experience and shedding the inhibition which he said made him a terrible Puritan up to that point, constrained, no doubt, by his mother's strict moralities. He was less able to cast off the influence of his traumatic family, however, which is the inspiration of much of the detail of the glass menagerie. For example, the family move to St. Louis for his father's job at the shoe company felt like a tremendous step down for the family in their living environment. The description of the apartment they moved into sounds very like the grim tenement building we see in the play, and the character of Amanda certainly owes a great deal to that of his mother, Edwina, who was very unhappy with the move to St. Louis. Although she was not born in the South, she adopted the heirs of a traditional privileged Southern family and she detested the relative impoverishment of their new life in the city. Like Amanda, she was also a self-consciously dramatic character, talking ceaselessly in what was described as a florid diction. What Williams described as her monolithic Puritanism was in stark contrast to his father, who was a drinker and a womanizer. As a salesman, Cornelius spent a lot of time away from home, and when he was there, he was a volatile presence. It was a loveless marriage and a toxic environment. The family lived in fear of him, and by the time Tom wrote The Glass Menagerie, he couldn't bear to visit home. Williams was also convinced that the pressures of the family home must have contributed to his sister's breakdown, and the figure of Laura in the play can be seen as an elegy of sorts to Rose. So I think we see in these details of the family um, the direct sources for some of the characters in The Glass Menagerie, and as he said, I suspect my only influences were Chekhov, D.H. Lawrence, and my life. So, John, I'm wondering, do you think it's useful to understand the facts of William's life when coming to interpret the play? Was this something you researched when you approached it? Absolutely. I mean, I, I adored the play. And outside everything we've already touched on, the, the uh, theatricality of it and the honesty of it and the its acknowledgement of, of, of liveness and its film noir atmosphere. It's the story that really gets me, just the, the kind of suffocation of that home. But I didn't really know how fully it was autobiographical until I started researching it when I was I took a sabbatical in 2010 to 2011 and went to Harvard University. I was a Radcliffe Fellow. Um, and for some reason there, I, I decided to delve very deeply into it and, and read some of the wonderful biographies and these memoirs uh, and started to realize that it wasn't just inspired by it was actually an absolute expressionist version of, of his life yes even to the point that he reclaimed his birth name which is tom thomas and 
I love the fact that he called himself Tennessee and also the responses to it. And, and it's so interesting that, that he chose to go down his father's family tree. Yes. Who he detested because his father was born in Knoxville, whereas his mother was from Ohio. And although she'd taken on the, as you say, airs and graces and romanticism of the Southern Belle. Yes. That it was his father, probably frustratingly for him, who actually had the, the Southern ancestry. And the responses to that from his kind of literary comrades at the time, I love Dorothy Parker's response to say, oh, should I call myself Palestine Parker, therefore? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he all, you know, St. Louis is the heart of the Midwest. And yet he took on this Southern accent, this Southern drawl, the, the kind of lawa, which was a total confection. So he, he, t- he totally reimagined himself, you know, in a way. And so interesting that he took on the name of Tom and Edwina became Amanda, obviously, and Rose became Laura. So it's, as you say, it's so close. But then in his real life, he, he seems to have this urge to remake himself. And it's somehow in the process of writing the play, he is actually making himself. It's some outlet for him to vent his feelings about his where he comes from, about his family, his frustrations and anger, of course, but also to try and find out who he is and where he's come from, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and it's an absolute, I think, act or an attempt to, I suppose, atone for mm-hmm. his the awful crimes he thinks he's committed against his mother and sister and how he's abandoned them. And it, it's, it's a memory play that's about betrayal, I think, and that he articulates beautifully how they are, you know, that vision of Amanda and in the end monologue, how he describes Amanda and Laura. It is like their furies. And because I was studying classics at the time, I just adored the fact that, you know, seeing Amanda and Laura was probably Amanda at the head of that kind of, <laughs> the head of that band of furies. Yes. And Laura being trailed kind of in Amanda's way. Of course. Well, Matt, we must come to actually, for the benefit of listeners who are not as familiar with it as you are, we must do an introduction to these characters and summary of what actually happens in the plot in the play. Before I ask you to do that, John, I want to just uh, quote something about William's actual autobiographical process. Gore Vidal once wrote in the same room with Williams and observed him at his practice. And he observed that Williams would enter entirely into his imaginary world when he was writing. As Williams himself described it, writing was an act of outer oblivion and inner violence, which is a great phrase. And he vowed to write plays that were a picture of my own heart. I think he's very consciously aware that that's what he's delving into and what he's working through. So let's, yes, the plot itself or the character itself. This may not be fair on you, John, but I want just a brief introduction again to who we have in the cast and what the setup is in terms of the plot of the play. Well, he announces himself that I am the narrator of the play and also a character in it. The other characters are my mother, Amanda, my sister, Laura, and a gentleman caller who appears in the final scene. He is the most realistic character in the play, being an emissary from a world of reality that we were somehow set apart from. And that kind of sums up the plot, really, by calling him the gentleman caller. Basically, we are presented in the first scene in Act One with their life, a slice of life, which involves Amanda talking about her her past and how 17 gentleman callers that she used to have back in the day in Blue Mountain and and we see Tom, they're just finishing dinner and Tom's about to go out to the movies, which which becomes code really for other activities that he's getting involved in, which we come to realise later. And we see that Amanda is desperate really to find a suitor for Laura, a gentleman caller. And I suppose it feels quite romantic and the, the language is very beautiful, particularly when Amanda goes back into a reverie of, of her youth. But actually, as we started to work on it, and led by Cherry Jones, really, who, who was the closest uh, of all of us to that world, having she was from Paris, Tennessee, and she knew the women who Amanda was absolutely born from. Right. And what we discovered is that this is not a, a romantic scene of, you know, lit by dappled sun. It's actually the hardship of what they're living in it towards the end of the depression as a single mother with absolutely no possibility of welfare or help from the state in any way and desperately trying to hold down a job while securing the future of her children yeah and and that's really what the play goes on to describe in the in the second scene we realize that ruby comes business college where amanda has been saving up and spending all her money to send laura to so that she would have some security as a job if she wasn't going to be married that actually Laura's not been going there she's been going to the zoo 
and she's been looking at the penguins. Yeah. And, and then what follows is Amanda desperately trying to get Tom to bring home one of his work colleagues. So there are five scenes in, in Act One. And then, I mean, it, I suppose it's always called seven scenes, but I see it as, a, as, as six scenes. Because Act Two for me is just one long scene of the evening where Tom brings Jim, the gentleman caller, over for dinner and and what unfolds quite dramatically and heartbreakingly. Yes, that's very good. So Amanda, the matriarch of the family, who has these airs and graces of the South, we don't know really how real they are, but she spends a lot of time talking about some privileged past or romantic past. But unfortunately, of course, she married the wrong man, for he abandons the family a long time ago, and all that remains of the father is a larger-than-life photograph of him that hangs over the mantle. And there's a great line, one of the great lines in all of theatre, I think, where Tom describes his father as he was a telephone man who fell in love with long distances. He gave up his job with the telephone company and skipped the light fantastic out of town. So that was his father. And then Tom is the wayward son who's trapped working in a shoe factory like Tennessee was. He's aspiring to be a writer as well, or at least to escape his mother in this apartment and find a life of adventure, as he calls it. And he spends most nights, as you suggested, going out to the movies, though, you know, we quickly figure out that he can't possibly be at the movies all that time. Where does he go? Question mark. Tom's sister, Laura, as you said, heartbreakingly, she is enrolled to do this typing course, but she's a very shy, nervous character, and she's too nervous to actually go to the classes or to type. So to maintain the pretense, she goes out during the day, all day, and uh, wanders around, including, as you said, to the zoo or takes refuge in a glass house with the tropical flowers to stay warm. That's, it's tragic. But, of course, um, Amanda discovers that this because she visits the school one day and realizes that Laura hasn't actually um, been going to class. So her decision is the only way out for Laura is to find someone to marry. And, of course, this would help support them financially because, as you also say, they're really challenged. And one of the themes of the whole thing is that there's this huge gap between Amanda's perception particularly of the world and her fantasies about the past and the reality of what they're living in. So, as you say, Tom invites this fourth character, Jim, to dinner. And he's a workmate from the factory. And, of course, Amanda goes to town with preparations for this dinner because she figures that this is the chance for Laura so she, you know, spends money they don't really have on improving the apartment, on new furnishings, on a dress for Laura, all set up for uh, this event, which we'll talk about in some detail in a minute because it, it's the uh, denouement of the whole play. But also you talked about the structure. It's really interesting because that first half of the play is those series of snapshot scenes giving us all of what we've just sketched in in terms of the background and the scenario of the of these characters in this family. And then the second half is this much longer, slower, different tone of scene between the two when Jim comes to dinner, which we'll also talk about. But a other thing about the structure of the play, John, I wanted to ask you about, was this form of this narrator who's both a character and narrating. And this is really innovative, as we said at the beginning. But what do you think this does? Why does Tom use it? What Tom? Why does Tennessee use the narrator? as a form in this play? What does that bring to it? I think probably, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful tool for a writer because it means that you, th there's an immediate relationship with the audience of that character. You know, he can be very, very clear that this is a memory play and this is an act of, of memory. It, it's an act of attempted catharsis in, in a way. And it, it almost feels like something he would do over and over and over again hoping for a different outcome which as we know is the definition of, of insanity <laughs> and but uh because it, it can't end any other way than how it ends and and that last monologue which is probably the greatest in my view the greatest piece of writing in in any play ever that last monologue where tom realizes that it's, it's pointless and that he, he can never escape this and for nowadays the world is lit by lightning i i, I won't I... we will come to the ending we will come to the ending but i think your idea that that he can't actually repeating it can't change it I, it never even occurred to me it is as you said he makes this statement right up front this play is memory so that the whole thing consists of his memories and he says these scenes are not realistic that it's subjective view of the past so what are we supposed to think this is unreliable 
Is that right? Or do we believe him? Well, it's a memory play, so I don't think he really... I think he's interested in truth, in terms of the truth of his experience, and certainly the truth of Laura's uh, story. And I suppose what he's setting out, without really claiming to, is, is a manifesto for theatre, and, and the idea that in order to be truthful, you have to do away with realism. Because realism are the ice cubes in the frigid air, I think, as he mentions in, in the introduction, when he talks about his vision for plastic theatre. But also in terms of the narrator as well, what's really useful about it is that you can impart so much information that's necessary for an audience in terms of, as you say, you know, the characters in the play, the setting of the play, the reasons that he's using particular things like a fiddle in the wings and et cetera, without encumbering the actual scenes with, you know, exposition. Yes. And you can just get right to the heart of what's going on in that family, which, is, of course, is exactly what happens. And then he describes the world in terms of Guernica when he's looking out at the Paradise Dance Hall and he describes what was going on in Europe, which is, uh, you know, the Spanish Civil War and heading towards World War Two. In Spain, there was Guernica, but over here there was music and dancing and trying to forget the depression. And so he very, very beautifully structures the way that we absorb that information in, in the 21st century. And without feeling it to be a burden or a chore in any way, we suddenly understand the poetic world of the America and the St. Louis that he's writing about. Yes. So uh, as you say, he can set it in context, but also be inside it as well. Yeah. And he explicitly frames the play as fiction as you said, and it's an emotional truth, isn't it, that he's, he's aiming for. There's a quote from Williams. When a play employs unconventional techniques, it is not trying to escape its responsibilities of dealing with reality or interesting experience, but is actually or should be attempting to find a closer approach, a more penetrating and vivid expression of things as they are. In other words, I suppose the emotional truth, as you say. And Tom even says at the beginning, I give you truth in the pleasant disguise of illusion. So this is all very conscious. And in fact, there are some theatrical devices, as we touched on at the beginning, about the way this is staged that Tennessee Williams is very specific about. There are very precise details in the stage directions and the introduction. And I wondered how you approach some of these. And it tells a little bit about what some of those are. There's the narrator, as we said, but there's some other things that he says about the way this thing should be staged, the screens and that sort of thing. Absolutely. And what we haven't talked about yet, the actual central image of the glass menagerie itself, it's all about light and transparency and the way that reality in the outside world bleeds in to this dingy apartment in St. Louis, which the entrance to is a fire escape and it's opposite the Paradise Dance Hall, which you can look over. So again, it would have been very radical, I think, in 1944 when the play was first produced, the idea of gauzes. And I mean, I, I know he'd been really inspired by Brecht as well, which, which led to the, his idea of what he told the projection, the titles, which I don't think any production has actually used, to my knowledge anyway. So the gauzes, just to be clear for listeners, the gauzes are these screens. So there's a screen at the beginning of the play, isn't there, that yeah. looks like the tenement wall, but then dissolves and you can see through or it even rises. But there's also a gauze screen between the living room and the dining room. Is that right? Uh, yes, exactly. It's a series of gauzes, so it's almost like a Russian doll, kind of semi-transparent Russian doll where, where you can see through to the next smallest doll inside, and he kind of slowly reveals the characters in the play. And it's got that sort of soft focus. Yes. So that it, it sort of enhances the sense that this is memory. Exactly. And the glass menagerie at the heart of that, as, as I say, the central image. The glass menagerie is Laura's collection of glass animals, the prize member of which is a unicorn, which is, is the most incredible image, at the heart of the play. And in terms of what happens during the dinner party and, and, and when Laura and Jim are left on their own, what happens is so shocking even though it's a tiny little bit of action, what happens to the unicorn is so shocking, much more than any battle or war or, <laughs> or vile murder or death in any other play, I think. Yes, it's a, it's a heartbreaking symbol. We'll come to the menagerie in a bit of detail. Well, you also mentioned the um, titles. So Tennessee Williams in the, uh, I guess it's the production notes somewhere, and in the very first production, apparently, in Chicago, he used these, those screens, on which were projected scene titles and images. What did he describe it? He said uh, to give accent to certain values in each scene. 
I, as you say, I, you didn't use these. They didn't use them in the original Broadway production either, but he still insisted um, on putting them into the text of the, of the play when it was published. And he defended their use in the production notes, I think. But I thought that he sort of underestimates the audience's ability to appreciate what's going on because he somehow thinks that the audience needs help with understanding what's happening by putting up these titles and these images. Very Brechtian. They're, they're very Brechtian devices. The idea of almost the issue of alienation, as it's described there, but by saying this isn't real. But one of the dangers with that, I think, and I think he was aware of this, but he still wanted to do it anyway, because there was also sound effects, really quite dramatic sound effects like lightning and thunder, etc., which all are almost the, the realm of melodrama and horror where, you know, someone would say a name and then <laughs> you would get a kind of bolt of light, lightning coming down. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, I think it, it kind of sits very awkwardly for me alongside the actual truth and beauty and incredible fragility of, of the play and the story and the lyricism of, of how he writes. And But I, I also adore the fact that he was like, I'm, I still want them there because that was what was in my head, even though I know none of you are going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you, I get the idea in te technically and, and theoretically about the distancing or, the, you know, and it underlines that this is the fiction of theater in Brechtian terms. But to me, it would it interrupts your emotional engagement and distances you in a way that I don't think is welcome or necessary uh, because we get it. Yeah, he knew that and he probably would hate it if he saw it. <laughs> we get it with the narrator, don't we? We get the distancing effect anyway. Totally. One of the things about the memory being the form of the play, but also one of the themes of the play, is that it relates to one of the themes about dreams and illusion, which is, I think, important. We talked about Amanda having these illusions about her southern life and the expectations for her children. Was that something you were conscious of in the story and how the characters behave as well in terms of what dreams they have and how real these are? Absolutely. You know, re real and heartbreaking. And in, in terms of how Bob Crowley, who I was very fortunate to have as my designer, we designed the set on a train journey from New York up to, up to Cambridge in Boston. And we kind of read in detail all of Tennessee's idea of plastic theatre. And I suppose the idea of expressionism, you know, really, really fueled our approach to the, to the whole thing. But And of course, illusion. So the fire escape that that Bob designed was almost like a bolt of lightning itself or a unicorn's horn because it went, it went right up up into the fly tower and, and just got thinner and thinner. And the, you know, the, the constant references to the moon, I was just thinking over the last couple of days as, as I very enjoyably disappeared into the play again, of course, the moon is the biggest of all the illusions because it appears to glow and actually it's just reflecting. Of course. It appears to emanate light when actually all it is is reflecting the sun. And that, that's such a wonderful illusion. And the moon comes back constantly. As Amanda says to Laura, come and make, wake a wish on the moon when she hears that Tom is, in fact, bringing a gentleman caller for dinner. And also one of the greatest accusations that Amanda you know, throws at Tom is, you live in a dream, you manufacture illusions. Sounds a bit rich coming from her, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, totally, although she, she can disappear into them, she doesn't move there. She stays where she is, which is as a single mother in St. Louis. And even though the illusions are there, she uses them, I think, in order to fuel Tom's awareness and that he is the only hope for Laura. And I suppose what she's seeing is, is herself as an older woman and knowing that Tom, because he's a man, will be fine. Tom is a man and will disappear off into whatever he's going to do, into more trips to the movies. Whereas her biggest fear is what will become of Laura? Because Tom's not going to look after her and her window for ensuring Laura's future is closing rapidly as she sees that Tom is going to not, she's not going to stay in that shoe factory for much longer. Yes, well, Amanda is the beginning of this whole theme of illusion, I guess, as you say, but you're right because of, you know, we see so overtly her pretense about this southern life and uh, excruciatingly when she gets dressed up for the dinner with when Jim the gentleman caller comes she puts on a dress that she wore 20 or 30 years ago and in some sense it appears a bit ridiculous but actually she does have a hard-headed part to her doesn't she where she knows what's at stake and what the realities are at some point in the play she's actually shown doing telephone sales for magazine subscriptions to other ladies 
and she puts on this patter to try and sell these magazine subscriptions, which is what all she can do to try and earn a few dollars to survive. And ironically, of course, there's a wonderful touch in there that the, she starts telling her potential customers about some of the stories that are published in this magazine, which are, of course, the classic romantic Southern story. So all of it comes back to this sense of illusion. And it's similar to, I thought, to Blanche Dubois or characters like that who also maintain this, this illusion of Southern gentility, but also very aware of the sordidness and the challenge of, the, of their real circumstances. I, I, I suppose, always thought that she was one of the characters like Maggie and the mother in the later plays, suddenly last summer and summer and smoke, etc. But actually, you know, Cherry was very, very clear that really Amanda has left illusion behind. She still uses it to conjure up an atmosphere, but deep down she's got absolutely no hope of living there anymore and and the idea of her flirting with the gentleman caller is, is not for herself which I, i've seen amanda presented as some kind of you know ridiculous older woman a kind of southern cougar who's who's trying to lure jim she's not trying to do that at all she's trying to lure jim towards laura yes exactly that's all she cares about and it's the only dress she's got because she spent every single cent that she's got on the dress for laura and and so that becomes very very heartbreaking but I suppose what I found really exhilarating and led by Cherry Jones is that Amanda is a realist. Yes, that's a really good point, because as William says in his character note for her, her characterization must be carefully created, not copied from type. So you, on the surface, you get this type of the Southern Belle, but there are so many hints, as you've said, at her survival instinct and how she's working so hard and uh, obviously it comes out as cajoling, but she's basically just trying to encourage both Tom and Laura to do something for themselves. She talks about how she's had to put up a solitary battle all these years, as you say, as a single parent. But she keeps trying to encourage them, try and you will succeed. We feel heartbreakingly that there's a gap between her reality and expectation for them too, which she must, she probably knows somewhere, but is still trying to think optimistically about what they might be able to do to improve their own individual and collected lot. Well, the alternative is unthinkable. The alternative is that Laura becomes, as she describes, the little bird who goes from family to family. She describes that in the second scene when she discovers that Laura's not been going to Rubicam's business college. And she describes the women from her past who, who, who never got married. And the idea of Laura becoming a little bird, staying in, in a kind of attic room or a guest room of, of a relative, that's the alternative. What nest? Where is her nest? Exactly. Well, what's going to happen to her? Because Tom's not going to. So, yeah, no, I, I think Amanda's one of the most realistic and practical characters in the whole Williams canon. It's really interesting because it's, that's not your immediate impression. Of course, she's set up in the first scenes and, and from Tom's perspective, of course, because remember, this is Tom's perspective. You see her as slightly shrill. She shouts every morning, rise and shine, get out of your beds. It's very grating. She seems so out of touch with the reality. And this, again, is Tom's perspective, and he bristles at that. So we do to some degree. So it takes a real depth, I think, in the performance as well to see that she has that strength and perspective and realism. Tom, on the other hand, is, is interesting because he comes across as being in some way Maybe he's some sort of realist, but actually he's he's got his own dreams as well, doesn't he? He's described in the character notes as a poet with a job in a warehouse. Yes, in a shoe factory. It's all that romance of being the writer, isn't it? I mean, he's yeah. got this sort of, like Tennessee may have done, this sort of dream idea of a poet. Absolutely, and, and the scenes where he, he shows Tom trying to write and Amanda is constantly badgering him. And, you know, I think that must speak of of Tennessee's relationship to Edwina, although she did buy him a typewriter when he was 12, and she always called him my writing son. Ah. Um, but yes, I think of course he wants to do that, but I think the question is, why hasn't he already left? And I think the answer to that lies in Laura. Also, Amanda, because I do think he adores his mother, and that was one of the other revelations for me. I think he absolutely adores her, and they are so alike. Interesting. I mean, I, I mean the play actually takes place over an unspecified period of time, but it's several months. Five or six months, yeah. From the way I would describe, you might assume that it's all happening in one, one day, but it isn't. And actually, so part of you is wondering throughout, why is he still there? Because he, he moans all the time, and he's clearly desperately unhappy and feels trapped. 
and talks about leaving an adventure. Yep. But he doesn't. And as you say, Laura is definitely part of it. I think it's the, the bulk of it, absolutely. But also, I think he hates himself and he hates his mother for the fact that it's only him that Laura has any chance of a future, really. And the fact that, of course, he's so much more interesting, particularly with Amanda and Tom, with characters who seem to just argue and go at each other, hammer and tongue, uh, all the time. Of course, that's because they adore each other and they're very, very alike. And, and there are moments, like just before he tells her that he's going to bring a gentleman caller home, there's a moment there where you see them giggling together and he enters into her, her hopes and dreams for Laura's future. Yes, he's, and he's done it. She was pressing him to ask someone from work and he actually, you didn't think he would carry this through, but he does it. Yeah, yeah. But also there's a profound contrast with his mother in a number of other ways. And I think this is based on the reality of his relationship with his own mother. There's this, obviously, a great tension about where he goes at night. And there's an even a, a specific debate about sex because his mother tries to confiscate his copy of D.H. Lawrence's novel, which to her represents filth. And we know that this went on in Tennessee's life, don't we? And also in Tennessee's writings, there's, always, there's this constant struggle between sensuality and the morality that preaches against such sensualities or indulgence. Absolutely. And I think it would it would probably break Amanda irreversibly if she knew exactly what he was doing when he said he was going to the movies, despite the fact that she knows 100 percent. I don't think she knows the detail or she's certainly, you know, that wonderful imagination will not she will not allow that to go to the movies with Tom. And, and there's another heartbreaking moment between Tom and Amanda where he, he's woken up as ever hungover and she's trying to get him to eat something before work and all he wants is black coffee. And she says, there are so many things in my heart that I cannot explain to you. And he almost tells her that he's a gay man. Yeah. And doesn't quite have the courage. And I, I never saw that when I encountered the play when I was 18. And I, I, don't, I don't know if I quite understood that Tom was clearly a gay man who was very, very clearly having wonderful, sexy escapades when he was going to the movies. Do you think that's uh, something we interpret because we, of what we know of Tennessee? No, it's, it's there in the play, absolutely there in the play. I think once you get a sense of who was going to those late night movies, it, was, it wouldn't be, in 1937, it would not be women. And, and also his adoration of Jim which is clear. I mean, maybe, of course, it is informed by Tennessee's life, but it was important to me to cast a gay actor and that the audience saw that clearly and that that was one of the great sources of the problems between him and Amanda. Interesting. And now, Tom and Amanda, you know, on the surface, they certainly have most of the speeches in the play and they're strong characters. But, you know, in some way, this is Laura's play. I mean, she is the emotional center certainly at the second half of the play so i wanted to ask you a bit about laura i read in the commentary of one edition of the text that for a successful portrayal of laura an actor has to be found who can project a kind of ethereal yet vivid presence and i said before at the very beginning before i even read that i used the word ethereal for kate o'flynn's marvelous performance in your production but laura is has a disability she has had a childhood illness that has left her crippled, one leg slightly shorter than the other, and held in a brace. But Williams was keen that her physical disability not be overplayed because it's her mental fragility that is most affecting and which we relate to. And Tom describes her as terribly shy, peculiar. She lives in a world of her own. So her physical disability mirrors her psychological disability. And she barely speaks. She is very timid. But is that all there is to her? How would you brief your actress about who Laura is? I mean, it, it's it's all there, despite the fact that she doesn't say much, particularly in the first act. It's all there, really, in, in the script. I suppose there would probably be a term to diagnose what she was these days, whether it be autistic or Asperger's or just in terms of the way she has a problem being in society in the way that Amanda wants her to be and the way that she's able to disappear into music or into her glass menagerie. And with the scene where she's left alone with Jim in candlelight because there's a power cut because Tom hasn't, no, no, no surprise to anyone, Tom hasn't paid the electricity bill. So in the middle of this incredibly important dinner party, the lights go out. Yes. And the glass menagerie works beautifully with candlelight. 
and, and she shows Jim the unicorn. But also in terms of it going from early spring to kind of late summer, she blossoms. She opens up like a bloom, like one of those flowers that blooms once beautifully and then dies. She opens up and she's the funniest. She's articulate. She's she's an amazing. And Jim's, Jim falls in love with her. Yes. Well, well, we'll come to that scene a little bit more as well, because that is the climax of the play, I think. But I also think it's interesting that what you've, you've alluded to is that there is some inner strength in her, isn't there? She's not a complete pushover. 100%. You know, it takes a while to see this. I read somewhere that she needs to be able to arouse pity without being pitiful. Yeah. Because I think we identify with her almost as much as any, any character in the play. And we need to feel that she is not so different from us, that we wouldn't relate to her fears and her, her self-consciousness because... So the physical disability disappears almost when she blooms, in a sense. The, the thing about this scene, and this is Jim, the gentleman caller, comes. They have dinner, and as you say, the lights go out, and there's just candlelight. And Jim recognizes how shy she is, talks quite a lot, tries to draw her out, and she does respond. The thing that we should point out is that they were at high school together, and she had a crush on Jim from afar, inevitably. She never revealed this. Jim just about remembers who she is because he had a nickname for her, which was Blue Roses, because at some point she was off school with pleurisy, and he's confused the word pleurisy with Blue Roses. Again, heartbreaking (laughs) use of image and symbol because there's no such thing as a blue rose or a unicorn. However, they have a past of some kind, and they, they touch each other because of this past. Jim also reveals, despite being one of those classic all-American high school stars, he reveals that he's been disappointing in his life so far and says everybody has problems. So they start to connect in a real way, don't they? The thing about this scene, isn't it, John, is that we as the audience, our hopes are raised. We begin to believe that this might be possible. Totally crazy, but we do. We end actually invested in this as we see Laura respond and Jim respond to her and think, oh my God, this could work. Is that right? 100%. I think they fall in love. And I think they fall in deep. I, I think all the preparation has been done. At, you know, he was interested in her enough to care that she'd been off school and why she was off school. And and, and I think she opens up something in him. And actually, I, I suppose that their roles kind of swap over as the scene progresses. And she's the one that leads him into this beautiful moment of pure romance and love. It's, it's a beautifully written scene and it's so brave. After giving us what were, you know, a series of very short scenes in Act 1, suddenly we move into this long scene which covers the whole of Act 2 and within that you've got a scene, you know, where the two characters you know the best, they're sent off stage and suddenly these almost fresh characters are left to hold the play and actually you realise that the play's about this. Yes. This is where we've been headed all along. But you also see signs of that with Laura in in the first act as well, when she sits up and waits for Tom to come home, home from the movies. She won't go to bed until he's come home and she knows he's safe. She's the one who puts him to bed. And you see see the steel in her then, I think. And then the next morning she comes in and she says, Tom, get up. Do not make me have to deal with mother. Get up, drink your coffee and go to work. There are little seeds in, in Act One that make you go, okay, this is a woman. She might be made of glass, but she's strong. I mean, this scene, this whole scene with Jim, the Guardian Review started with a rhetorical question. Is there a better scene in American theatre? And it is absolutely exquisite because, as we've said, that you are so in tune with the emotional tension as it unfolds here and the hope for Laura. You are so empathetic with her and, and with Jim and you want this to work. But again, I guess the spoilers are, as you wouldn't be surprised, it doesn't work. Jim, it turns out, has already committed, engaged to Betty. <laughs> uh, Betty is the prosaic name <laughs> for the reality of what uh, what he is going to. And you, and you very much get the sense that he's doing this because this is what needs to happen in, in his life. Yeah. This will be the secure future, not out of passion. It it can't be stressed enough, really, how incredibly brave that is of Tennessee Williams when the the two famous characters from The Glass Menagerie, Tom and Amanda, as I say, are taken off stage and suddenly these 
almost new to us characters are given 30 minutes. But we've been, I mean, don't we think in some way we've been waiting to hear from Laura? Oh, totally. The thing about the performance that Kate gave, and, and I think that's there in the play with Laura, is that you're watching her the whole time because she's watching everybody else, but you are watching her. You are attuned to her every response. Absolutely. The thing that's also heartbreaking about it is that Jim goes so far and does seem to be genuinely responding to Laura and caring for her, but he screws this up big time, really, doesn't he? Jim really, you know, his crime is that he falls in love in a way that he never thought was possible. And then suddenly they kiss and it's the most electric lightning that either of them have ever experienced. And then suddenly he realizes that what he's done is dreadful. Yes. And, and then we're, we're propelled towards this final, very, very short, but the most ferocious and the most heartbreaking and the, the cruelest exchange between Amanda and Tom that still breaks my heart, where she says to him, go then, go to the moon, you selfish dreamer. Because, of course, Amanda quite rightly is blaming him for not knowing that Jim was already engaged. But the thing is, I wanted to ask you about was Laura's reaction, because we're getting towards the end now, the end of the play, end of our time. Laura's response to this, because, you know, you fear for her the entire play, don't you? I mean, she is barely able, when this whole plan is, is launched, She's barely able. She can't even come to dinner to the table because she's so such a bundle of nerves. So you fear for her as to what her reaction will be now that she's she's come out of herself. She's taken a chance and she's been knocked back. I think she finally disappears into her galaxy of glass menagerie. And it's a place from which she will never be able to return. And I think Tom knows that. I think I think Amanda knows that she's blossomed and she never thought she would. And life it's not bearable to imagine in continuing after knowing that joy. And this is a kind of theatrical disappearance. Practically speaking, I've got no idea what happened to Amanda and Laura. But, but what we're left with is Tom's utter betrayal of the memory of them as, as the Furies, as I say. But I think Laura just knows that that was her life and she saw the possibilities and she knows she won't be able to recreate that. And so all that's left is a glass menagerie. Am I allowed to say what happened to the unicorn? Yes, I was just going to say, but she gives the unicorn to Jim. Is that a gesture of defeat or defiance? She gives the dehorned unicorn to Jim because, of course, as they're dancing, they knock the unicorn off the table and the unicorn's horn breaks off, which, of course, is, again, one of the most incredible image actions in theatre history. And she's left holding the unicorn's horn which is broken off, and she gives him the dehorned unicorn. It's almost a saying, now that we've done this and you're going back to Betty, this is who you are. You are a unicorn without a horn. Because you, you see what it's like with me. <laughs> it's interesting because she describes unicorn without the horn as less freakish. Yeah. It's like all the other horses now, of course. But it's a, clearly it's well, it's a symbol of broken dreams. It seems almost too obvious, but it is incredibly moving and touching. But I think her giving it to Jim, there's something in that that's not just giving up. There's something about, I'm okay, you can have this, I'm not going to keep it anymore. Or is it just that she can't bear it to? I think in Tom's retelling and his memory of this, he thinks that his actions and his mother's actions have destroyed her. Yeah. Of course there's a possibility. You know, we've seen the possibility of, of Laura as an incredibly strong woman. But I, I think what Tennessee wants us to feel at the end is that this is everyone's fault because nowadays the world is lit by lightning that Laura couldn't thrive and it's a warning to the world to make sure that we nurture and look after the unicorns yes they enrich our world and I think that that's what ultimately makes me constantly come back to this play and care about it deeply because it's almost like a war cry a battle cry for unicorns Tennessee is kind of saying to the world discard people like this at your peril. Nurture them, create a world where these people can thrive. So that scene happens, Tom leaves. Some months later, actually, it was saying he doesn't go immediately and it comes back to him standing outside and sets as the narrator and it's from the future. He was fired from the shoe factory for writing a poem on the lid of a shoe box, which I think is another one of those beautiful succinct images juxtaposing the dream of art versus the everyday material commercial world. But he finally does leave home 
And Williams wrote about Tom in the character list at the start of the play, saying his nature is not remorseless, but to escape from a trap, he has to act without pity. So he has abandoned them. And like, I guess, as we've alluded to many times, Tennessee left home and possibly feels some guilt about that, particularly in relation to his sister Rose, as Tom does in relation to Laura, because in this last speech he makes direct to the audience, he tells about the years that have gone since and how he's been on the move. We don't really know what he's been doing in terms of his career or anything. It doesn't really matter because the central image is that he's haunted by his sister, Laura. And he even describes seeing her from time to time, who's coming up and tapping him on the shoulder. And then there is an image of Laura and Amanda behind the gauze screen. Amanda is consoling Laura from presumably that evening or at any time. So she's still there, Amanda, trying to support Laura, and they're still there in some form, I guess, trying to survive. But it's, it's not a very positive picture, potentially, of what come of the two of them after he leaves, is it? No, not at all. And she says, go to the moon, you selfish dreamer. That's Amanda's parting words to Tom, and he says, I didn't go to the moon, I went much further. For time is the longest distance between two places, which, you know, just war. You'd like to have written that, wouldn't you? Oh, <laughs> I'm all right with the fact that Tennessee wrote it and I can read it and have it in my bones. And direct it. Yeah, well, exactly. And so Tom, further than the moon, he, he disappears. And, and again, we go back to the kind of language of film noir in a way, a very poetic description of, you know, walking past windows and leaves and bits of coloured glass. And then, of course, to the wondrous line, for nowadays the world is lit by lightning. And so blow out your candles, Laura. And so goodbye. That's probably the first time I've ever been able to read that line or think of it without actually going into ugly crying. <laughs> yes, when she blows out the candles at Tom's instruction. Well, the play, actually, the, you know, the lyricism of this language just reminds me that the play was greeted in its time as distinctive for its form and for its language. Arthur Miller said, in one stroke, the glass menagerie lifted lyricism to its highest level in our theater's history. American theater found an eloquence and an amplitude of feeling. But one might also say sometimes Williams' language can be quite florid and melodramatic and his, the symbols are they somewhat obvious, the, you know, the, the unicorn or the glass menagerie. This is his heightened theatrical style, isn't it? But do you think it's in danger of being sentimental? Not at all. I think it's really robust and I think it's incredibly challenging. I think it's bleak in, in, in the best way because, as, as I say, I think it's a, it's a very, very deep warning to us to make sure that we create a world where Laura's and unicorns can thrive. And to my mind, it's the most perfect of his plays. It's interesting that it's never really worked as a film. There's never really been an iconic film of The Glass Menagerie because it only exists in theatre as a piece of absolute theatre perfection, I think. I think The Unicorn could be seen as, I suppose, a, a very recognisable, familiar image, but it wasn't then. And certainly the idea of a central image like that telling us everything we need to know about the play has ensured that it will and will always be incredibly relevant and feel incredibly modern. I was just being devil's disciple, John, of course, because uh, I obviously, as we just, I think we just responded to, we find this poetic language enthralling. Yeah. I mean, his his ear for the, the Southern diction and how it masks deeper truths, for example, in Amanda, and also the imagery of the menagerie is still heartbreaking, really, irresistible. Uh, one of the critics wrote of the first production that no one could understand why this ostensibly slight play affected them so deeply. Mm. But it, it, it clearly does. And I think it's uh, also because we said earlier it's about family and we're given a range of family characters who we might recognize. We're not necessarily identical, but we certainly recognize some of the tensions and pull of love that happens in family. The paradox of being uh, supported, but also finding it claustrophobic or there's a, you mentioned at the very beginning the biographies you read. John Lahr, who's wrote a massive biography of Tennessee Williams summarized, I think, very well the intent and effect of Williams' style. He said, Williams' dramatic goal is to redeem life from the humiliation of grief through beauty. I was going to say to you, John, surely it's the beauty that stays with us. The beauty of the language, the images, and his empathy for the suffering endurance of his characters. I don't think you can come out of the theater after seeing this play without a sense of beauty, as I did from yours. 
which is ultimately uplifting. Is that not true? Absolutely. I, yeah, I think it is uplifting because, I, as I've said a couple of times already, to, to, what I discovered was that I think it is a war cry. Tennessee was so guilt-ridden, not, not necessarily about his mother, but particularly what happened to Rose, because his mother, he gave half the royalties to her. So in reality, the royalties on the Glass Menagerie allowed Edwina to leave Cornelius, which she promptly did, because she was so unhappy with him. It was Lyle Leverich. He talks about Tennessee, that the only reason that he also didn't go crazy in that environment at home, which led to Rose's difficulties, was because he had writing to escape to. I do find it heartbreaking as a theatre maker that art does offer us some immediate respite from actually being able to process the world, from disappearing in, into a glass menagerie. And I find that really very moving. Yeah, it's, it's astounding, really, that he transformed this trauma into something so beautiful. Yeah. And I guess that's the paradox of the way we feel when we come out, because we're so moved about the tragedy of these characters. It's not a good outcome. And yet, this is the paradox, is that we're uplifted by beauty. So there is something redemptive goes on in the art. Ha, ah, we've gone over time, I'm afraid, John. Thanks so much for this wonderful discussion. One of the traditions of our podcast is that I like to ask my guests to recommend a play that we could talk about in a future episode. So is there a personal favorite from the plays you've directed already, maybe, or perhaps one that you long to do that you'd be happy to nominate? Well, um, I haven't directed this play, or, or I, don't, I don't think I would do it, because the production I saw was so incredible. And it's a recent play. It's Carol Churchill's Escape to Loan. Oh, it's one of my favorites. Great choice. I could have chosen any of Carol's plays, to be honest with you. But Escape to Loan, while I've been an associate director of the Royal Court, Escape to Loan was written and performed there. And Carol doesn't take commissions, so she'll... One day, suddenly she'll phone up and say, oh, I've written a play. Would you like to read it? And I would say, yes, I think I would. <laughs> yeah. um, and Escape to Loan, which is basically four women in their 60s or 70s having tea in, in the garden of one of those women. It starts with direct address to the audience and suddenly the garden fence is revealed and you see four women sitting there and interspersed is a monologue from one of the characters which keeps returning and describing a very, very different world to the garden tea party that you're seeing in front of you. And I think it's astonishing. John, I would love to do this play. So thank you for that suggestion. You're welcome. Thank you so much for today, John. It's been great meeting you and, and talking about this wonderful play. As the candles are extinguished on the story of Amanda, Laura, and Tom, what do we imagine for their futures? What have they or we learned about how to live more happily? It's hard to see a prescription for survival or success. What we do recognize is the common plights of loneliness, of harboring dreams that may be illusory, and the paradox of family as support and suffocation, all part of the swirling mix from which we seek to define our own identity and find self-worth and peace. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at the play pod you're also welcome to email plays at the play to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes you can also register your suggestion on the website thanks again and see you next time